12 U.S. soldiers were flying home from Iraq for a two-week leave in July of 2004. They were at the airport uh, waiting to board the plane when a first-class passenger came up to one of the soldiers and, and shook his hand and thanked him for his service and then asked him to come to the counter with him. And, and there, the passenger with the first-class ticket asked the flight attendant if he could trade his first-class ticket with this soldier who had a ticket for coach. And the flight attendant said, sure. And all of a sudden, that, that act of thankfulness started to spread and become contagious. Other passengers who had first-class tickets also found a soldier and thanked them for their service and, and brought them up to the counter and started this exchange until all the first-class passengers had traded their first-class tickets to soldiers who were supposed to be in coach. Davila Evans the flight attendant on the American Airlines flight that day said, I was so privileged to be flying with these two groups of unselfish and grateful people. Here you have these kids who are putting their lives on the line, protecting our freedoms. And, and here you have these people who gave up their first class seats, seats that people usually fight over. You really have to have a large heart to do something like that. That flight attendant was right. She was privileged to be flying with those two groups of grateful and unselfish people. Those U.S. soldiers were sacrificing many of their freedoms and risking their lives to preserve our freedoms. And while you can't really compare giving up a first-class ticket to giving up your life, it's still a powerful act of gratitude that in this case became contagious and spread throughout the whole plane. Thankfulness is like that. When we demonstrate it sincerely, it's contagious. And as Christians, we should be models of that kind of sincere gratitude to one another, but also and especially to God. Jesus didn't just risk his life for us. He sacrificed his life for us so that we could have eternal life and abundant life. This is something for which we should be eternally grateful. We've been studying the book of Colossians. And I've mentioned several times that the main purpose of this letter is to proclaim the supremacy and all sufficiency of Christ. But we've also noticed that in several places, another dominant theme of the book will surface, a theme of thankfulness. And one of the places where we see this theme of thankfulness is in Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. This theme of gratitude is important for all Christians to live out, to demonstrate, to practice towards one another, and especially towards Jesus. But how do we do that? And what does that look like in real life? Last week, I talked about how we should live as God's chosen people. Well, today, I want to talk about how we should live as God's thankful people. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. Before we read this passage... Let's pray and ask God to bless our time in his word and to speak to us through this powerful passage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, as we open up your word today, as we take a look at the book of Colossians in chapter 3 in this passage about thankfulness, God, I pray that you would help us to live out lives of sincere gratitude. I pray that your word would penetrate our hearts and saturate our souls and just help us to meditate on and really take in how much you've done for us through Jesus Christ. 
And I pray as a result, it would transform us and develop within us a deeper level of sincere gratitude for you. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Colossians 3, 15 through 17. This is a short passage, just three verses long, but three times in this passage, Paul emphasizes the importance of gratitude and thankfulness. Listen to these words. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, as as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord, a powerful word. A word about thankfulness. So how can we live as God's thankful people? Well, first of all, we need to let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. That's what he says right off the bat in verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace and be thankful. Jesus, of course, is the Prince of Peace. And he's given us this incredible blessing As Christians, we have his peace living within us, and he gives to us peace in many different ways. Uh, The word peace is a powerful word. It's more than just the absence of war. In Hebrew, it's the word shalom. And uh, Jews, even still today, use this word as a greeting that indicates prosperity and health and wholeness, uh, a desire for restored relationships, healthy relationships. And today they still greet one another by saying, Shalom Aleichem, peace be upon you. And Jesus has given us this blessing in many different ways. Peace be upon you. Probably the most important blessing of peace we have in Christ is peace with God because of what Jesus did for us at the cross. In Romans 5.1, it says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, our sins separated us from God. Our sins made us enemies of God. Our sins are cosmic treason against the almighty creator and his holy nature. Our sins elicit the wrath of God. But Jesus, because of his great love for us, was willing to go to the cross and take all of our sins upon himself and all of our punishment that we deserved upon himself so that we could have a restored relationship, a good relationship with God, so that we could be reconciled and have peace with God. And for that, we must be eternally grateful. Another way that Jesus gives us peace is he gives us peace. Peace of mind, peace with ourselves, peace in a really messed up world with all kinds of problems. I don't know if you've been watching the news lately, but we live in a really messed up world. And a lot of people are troubled in their spirits, in their minds, in their hearts, and they need the peace of Christ. On the night before he was crucified, Jesus told his disciples, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Later that same evening, he said this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome this world. No doubt we are living in very strange and difficult times. And a lot of people are struggling with anxiety, with fear, with with these uh, troubling concerns, frustration, anger, troubled hearts. But we need to remember that as Christians, we have the peace of Christ within us. Jesus has overcome this world. 
And in him, we can have peace, even in the difficult times we're facing today. However, in the context of Colossians 3, I think Paul has a specific kind of peace in mind. And as great as peace with God is, as great as peace with the troubled events and situations we face is, I think he's talking about peace in our relationships with one another. Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, in God's church, God's family, getting along together. That's why he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ be like an umpire, a guiding force to draw us together in unity. He says the reason for this command is the fact that as Christians, we are members of one body, the church. And we've been called to peace. Last week, we talked about living as God's chosen people. And we looked at all these different character traits that we are to put on in verses 12 through 14. All those character traits are character traits demonstrated in relationships. They are character traits of Christ that lead us to demonstrate peace with one another. As Christians, we need to demonstrate peace and unity with one another in the body of Christ. While interviewing a young African-American soldier on the eve of Desert Storm, the first one, ABC correspondent Sam Donaldson asked, how do you think the battle will go? Are you afraid? Well, we'll do okay. We're well trained, the soldier said, gesturing toward his fellow soldiers. And I'm not afraid because I'm with my family. At that point, some of the old, old other soldiers with him shouted, say that again. He didn't hear you. And so he did. He spoke up a little louder. This is my family. We take care of each other. In his book, My American Journey, Colin Powell described this interview. And he made some comments that are extremely relevant for us today. He concluded his comments with an urgent appeal for Americans to stop fighting with each other. And even though this was written back in 1995, this is a message that we desperately need to hear today. Listen to what Colin Powell said. We have to start thinking of America as a family We have to stop screeching at each other, stop hurting each other, and instead start caring for and sacrificing for and sharing with each other. We have to stop constantly criticizing, which is the way of the malcontent. We need to get back to the can-do attitude that made America. We have to keep trying and risk failing to solve the country's problems. We cannot move forward if cynics and critics swoop down and pick apart anything that goes wrong to the point where we lose sight of what is right, decent, and uniquely good about America. And I would add this. As Christians, as God's thankful people, this is the attitude we need to have towards one another as God's church, as God's family, as the one body of Christ. As Christians, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We're part of God's eternal family. If we truly are thankful for the peace Jesus has given to us, then we should demonstrate peace towards one another and let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. How should we live as God's thankful people? Well, we also need to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. That's what he says in verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. And as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Another blessing that we have in Christ that we should be eternally grateful for is his word. His eternal word. The words of Jesus are words of eternal life and abundant life. The words of Christ inspire us, encourage us, and direct us. 
the words of Christ, if they are living in us, richly dwelling within us, they will cause us to grow spiritually and become fruitful. That's what Jesus promises to us in John 15. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, it will be given to you. This is my father's, this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. In that same passage, Jesus told his disciples earlier that apart from me, you can do nothing. He described himself as a vine. He says, you are the branches. You got to stay connected to the vine. And here in this verse, he indicates that one of the ways we stay connected to Jesus is by allowing his word to dwell within us richly, to live within us. This phrase, the word of Christ, is not just talking about the words Jesus spoke during his ministry on earth. It's also talking about the message about Christ that we see in every book of the Bible. Jesus is at the heart of all the books of the Bible. All the books of the Bible point us to Jesus. And the Bible is a message about him. It is the word of Christ. This message is the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.16 says that we are to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. And notice that this is a command given to us, not as individuals, but collectively as God's people, God's church, the one body of Christ. He says, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, the you in this passage is a second person pronoun that's plural. We might say if we were in the South, y'all. Okay? Let the word of Christ dwell in y'all richly, as y'all teach one another, and as y'all sing these songs. This, this kind of growth must take place in a community of faith. When we sing songs together as a church, we're not just a bunch of individuals privately worshiping God in a personal relationship with Him. We are His church, the collective body of Christ, worshiping together, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another and to God. Singing worship songs is a great way for us to teach one another about Jesus and encourage one another with the message of the gospel. In fact, Paul gave the Colossians a hymn at the beginning of this book in chapter 1. Virtually all Bible scholars agree that Colossians 1 verses 15 through 20 was a hymn of the early church that Christians in those first centuries of the church sang about Christ to one another to encourage them with the words of Christ. Listen to these powerful words in this song in Colossians 1, 15 through 20. He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. This is a song about Jesus. And it goes on to say, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was well pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This hymn is the heart of the book of Colossians. And Paul gave the Colossians this hymn because he knew they needed to focus on Christ, the word about Christ, and sing this hymn about Christ to one another, reminding one another just who Jesus is and what he's done for us. If we are truly thankful for the blessings we have in Christ, we will gather together 
and remember Jesus every week and encourage one another with these powerful words about Jesus. A local newspaper had a Sunday morning religion section that contained, among other things, letters to the editor about various religious issues. Most of the time, these letters were pretty innocuous, but one Sunday, something was printed that became quite controversial. Someone wrote in and said, I quit going to church this year. I decided that listening to sermons week after week was a stupid thing to do. After all, I went to church for more than 40 years of my life. I've probably heard about 5,000 sermons, but I can only remember maybe five of them. What a waste of time. Signed, Bored and Busy. Well, as I'm sure you could imagine, there was a fury of incoming letters responding to this sentiment. Some people wrote that sermons do make a difference and church does matter, while others sided with Bored and Busy's letter, and they said that it's basically meaningless to go to church and unnecessary to listen to sermons. Finally, one letter was printed that ended the debate. I quit eating this year. Thanks to Bored and Busy's insights, I've decided that eating week after week was a stupid thing to do. After all, I've been eating for more than 40 years. And during my lifetime, I've probably had 5,000 meals. But I can only remember about five of them. What a waste of time. Signed, Starved and Stupid. Sometimes we may wonder if it does any good to go to church or listen to a message or read your Bible or have a Bible study with a friend. Like bored and busy, we might feel too bored and busy to go to church and remember Jesus. But don't overlook the fact that we need a steady diet of the gospel in order to keep our faith in Christ healthy, just like people need food to keep their bodies healthy. So our spirit depends on the word of Christ to be healthy. Romans 10, 17 says, Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. We should be thankful for the word of Christ and eager to hear it, even if we think we've heard it 5,000 times before. We should never stop being energetic and enthusiastic and eager to hear the word about Christ. It keeps our spirit and soul healthy. It keeps our faith strong and healthy. In order to grow as Christians, we need spiritual food, and we need to come together as God's people, God's thankful people, and encourage one another with the word of Christ. Sure, not every spiritual meal is going to be memorable, but it will provide us with the spiritual nourishment we need to survive and thrive as Christians, not only as individuals, but as his church. How should we live as God's thankful people? We must do everything in the name of Christ. Paul says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This phrase, in the name of the Lord Jesus, is an important phrase that all Christians should understand. It indicates both a great privilege and a great responsibility The phrase in the name of the Lord Jesus indicates that as Christians, we wear the name of Christ. We represent him. We are his ambassadors to this world. And this phrase in the name of also indicates authority, power. Christ has given us his name and given us authority and the ability to represent him in a way that will honor him. Alexander the Great was one of the greatest military leaders who ever lived. He conquered almost all of the known world before he was 33 years old. One night during a campaign, he couldn't sleep, and so he got up out of his tent and he started to walk around 
the campground and inspecting the site. And as he was walking, he came across a soldier who was supposed to be on guard duty, but he was asleep. And that time, sleeping on guard duty was a serious offense, many times punishable by instant death. The soldier began to wake up as Alexander looked down upon him, and the soldier realized that it was his commander who was watching him sleep on guard duty. Alexander the Great said, Do you know the penalty for sleeping on guard duty? And the soldier, quaking in his sandals, said, yeah, 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 Yes, sir. Alexander the Great looked at him and says, What is your name, soldier? And the soldier, meekly shaking and quivering, said, my, 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 my name is Alexander, sir. Alexander the Great says, what? what? What did you say your name is? Sir, my, 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 my name is, is, is Alexander. And a third time, Alexander the Great says, soldier, what is your name? The soldier said a third time, yeah, my, my, my name, my name is Alexander, sir. Alexander the Great stared at him sternly and said, soldier, either change your name or change your conduct. As Christians, we wear the name of Christ. And we need to live in a manner worthy of the name by which we've been called. We represent him as his ambassadors to the world. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. How we live the things that we do and the things that we say affect our witness for Christ, and they reflect on the name of Christ. This is a great privilege, a great responsibility. God is working through our words and our actions to lead people to Christ. That's why Paul says, whatever you do, in whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all in the name of Jesus in a way that brings honor and glory to his name and leads people to believe in the name of Jesus. So like David in Psalm 69, we should be extremely sensitive to how our words and our actions affect the faith of the people around us. Listen to what David, the king of Israel, a leader of God's people, said in Psalm 69, this was a sincere prayer of David. He prayed, may those who hope in you not be disgraced because of me. O Lord, the Lord Almighty, may those who seek you not be put to shame because of me. O God of Israel, as ambassadors of Christ, this is a prayer we need to pray. Before we speak, before we respond to that post on social media, we need to pray, God, are my words going to bring honor to the name of Christ and help people to strengthen their faith in Jesus? Before we do whatever we want to do, we need to pray, God, are my actions, my deeds going to demonstrate the character traits of Jesus and lead people to faith in Christ? A parallel passage to Colossians 3 is found in Ephesians 5. There Paul says, speak to one another. Christians coming together, not just to worship God as individuals, but coming together as the body of Christ. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we are Christians, we need to live as God's thankful people in every situation we face. No matter what we're doing, no matter where we are, no matter what we're going through, people should see us as God's thankful people, giving thanks to God in the name of Jesus. 
Oral Hershiser pitched an unbelievable 1988 season for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Following a complete game shutout in August, he pitched multiple shutout innings and hurled five more complete games through the end of the regular season. He did not allow his opponents to score an earned run in 59 consecutive innings. Not one. When the Dodgers faced the New York Mets in the National League playoffs, Oral continued to dominate hitters, leading the Dodgers to victory by pitching more than 24 innings, crowned by a complete game shutout in the final game. And in the World Series, his complete game victory over Oakland A's in Game 5 clinched the series for the Dodgers. No wonder Oral was awarded the Cy Young Award and two MVP awards, one for the National League playoffs and the other for the World Series. However, during the playoffs, the TV camera zoomed in on this legend in the making. There they caught Oral in the dugout between innings, singing softly to himself. The cameras could not pick up the words he was saying. And so the announcer merely commented that Oral's recent success certainly gives him something to sing about. But Oral was not singing about baseball. A few days later, Oral Hershiser uh, was on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And Johnny played this clip from the news of Oral Her uh, Hershiser singing in the dugout. And he asked him about this. He said, well, what was it that you were singing? Can you, can you sing it for us now here on the show? And of course, the audience cheered and roared, encouraging him to do so. And with reluctance, Oral sang softly the tune that the TV cameras could not hear during the game. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. No matter what he was doing, whether it was playing baseball or resting in between innings, Oral wanted the thanks and praise to go to God. He wanted to live as one of God's thankful people. As God's thankful people, let's make our lives a song of praise and thanksgiving to God in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's make our lives a song that all the people around us can see and hear and recognize as praise to God. We're going to pray and sing one more song before we're dismissed. And as we do that, let's think about how we can live as God's thankful people this week. Let's think about how we can let the peace of Christ rule in our hearts. How we can let the word of Christ dwell richly within us. And how we can do everything, whether it's what we say or what we do, in the name of Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. Let's pray. Our righteous Heavenly Father, we have so much to be thankful for. When we recognize what Jesus has done for us, when we meditate on the message of the gospel, we are overwhelmed with gratitude. But God, I just pray that as we go out from this place, as the busy week uh, comes upon us and we get wrapped up in the concerns and worries of this world, that you would draw us back to that message of the gospel and remind us to live as your thankful people in every situation of life. God, I pray that the peace of Christ would rule in our hearts and that we would let the word of Christ dwell within us richly. And God, that everything we do, whether in word or deed, it would be done in the name of Jesus as we represent him to the world around us. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.